you never know what could happen if you don't show up. Yet, so many people fail by never even starting. Whether you want to get into college, land a dream job, or change the world, the only way to succeed is to start on that path and to keep going. So hello and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast with myself, Samuel Webster-Harris, nudging you with some positive psychology of self-improvement. On the show today, we have the inspirational Jonathan Petridas, otherwise known as JP. He is the founder of the company All Plants, who have created millions of meals for vegan curious people, making it more delicious and simple to eat a meat-free diet. As I just said at the beginning, if you want to do something big, you have to get going, and trying to make humanity eat more plant-based is no easy task. But if you start, then you will get somewhere. JP has certainly started and is getting somewhere and is a bundle of inspiration for anyone that listens to him. And he has loads of lessons for people wanting to do ambitious things. So I think you'll get a lot out of this episode. We discuss and learn about the importance of taking breaks to work out what's actually worth doing. Some of the most difficult lessons that JP's learned running all plants and how to convert a no into a yes. JP is incredibly motivating and inspiring person to listen to. So I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by JP, the founder of All Plants, which is just one of my favorite brands and companies in terms of making the world a more sustainable place and getting people to eat more plants, which is a thing I care about. I, I love plants and eating them is a, is a super thing to be doing. Just to verify, on plants, we're talking about fruit, veg, nuts, legumes, beans, etc. not you know, like your common house plant. I just wanted to make sure, Sam. I, just... I did eat weird stuff as a, as a child that's for sure well thanks for having me i'm very i'm very happy to be here too cheers man it's good to hear so yeah you've had a really interesting life so far it seems maybe you should just introduce yourself a bit more so then like where are you coming from like why did you go through africa and how did we get to where we are now it's quite an expansive question you said i've had an interesting story that's one way of looking at it i mean i went through all the relatively conventional school, university, and trying out lots of the careers that were kind of forced down our throat by parents and society, I suppose. So all of the professional services, trying to be a good citizen and tried out accounting and banking and even had a fleeting period of seven months as a paralegal and fortunately learned that I definitely did not fit the paradigm of these worlds. My last sortie there was a couple of years in management consulting, and then I left McKinsey 12, 13 years ago now to start building ventures from scratch. And I guess I'd learned through management consulting that I really, really enjoyed working on very complex problems and trying to pull together teams of really talented, passionate and driven people. But yeah, I learned a lot, span up dozens of harebrained ideas, shut them all down relatively quickly at different in weeks or months. That it was through that process that eventually I stumbled upon the problem that we're solving with all plants, but that was through a very personal journey into changing how I ate for my own personal reasons, then realizing, bloody hell, this needs to change at a high scale and it needs to change fast. And why is it not easier? And why on earth is it not more delicious for everyone? Because if I have the time to cook it for myself, it is. But most of the time, we don't have that time. That's cool. Like I really identify with what you described with like the fallow period. I've identified that I don't see normal jobs very well and I'm much more creative and just like thinking about what's wrong with the world and where I'm going to fix it and started way too many things over the past few years thinking about what I really want to do and sort of backtracking and yeah a fallow period is a nice way to, to describe it like getting energy for yourself and these things. To be, to be honest with you Sam interestingly I found it energy sapping because I am not designed to be a scientist in a lab tinkering with things that, but keeping them in a test tube and never really yeah, it's like, letting it's like you've got this engine day. in your mind ready to go and you're trying to like fix it into a different gearbox and each one like you start and if I was wearing it's like boom, it's not working it's like you have to put it down and start a new thing so yes it's very difficult <laughs> all, all the dead ends right all the like no I'm going to shut it down no uh, no this isn't the right thing I found it really draining yeah, especially talking to your parents and they're like, oh, maybe get a job again. And you're like, no, <laughs> Mate, that's the that's the first thing you have to neutralize. That was a very yeah big, a big hurdle to overcome. Bless my parents. But as I think most parents have the best intentions for their children, but also relatively conventional view on what security and success looks like. And that still persists, I'm, I'm sure. But I think the fallow period thing is really important as well, because what I found it's kind of what I was talking about earlier around the naivety combined with 
kind of positivity or energy. I'm a real believer in this. If you're going to start something, starting any venture is so hard. And then building it into anything remotely useful that actually has any value in the world to anyone is hard. And then building it to any scale where it creates any value for anyone is really, really hard. And so how do you find something that you can commit to that you'll actually not just be excited about working on now, like in the short term, but that you will genuinely work consistently crazy hard on for decades. And I found that the most important thing to that is that it has to be something that you deeply connect with in a very personal way and also something that's bigger than yourself. Because quite frankly, if people are in the, the venture and entrepreneurial world to make themselves rich, they're in the wrong game. There's much more reliable ways to do that that are lower stress and in the most part will have a better payoff. And so if you're not doing something that you have done the work and done the internal kind of like searching to really know, I'm committed to this for decades and this is the mission that matters to me, then you can unlock amazing resilience. And, you know, you can actually think from a strategic perspective in a much longer way, which is so enabling and important. That's, I guess, one of the things that I had with my fallow period. I have to say my first business and realizing how much more stress there was than I expected as I started it and like how much different my job was to what I thought I'd be doing. So I'd be starting different projects and then realizing what it would actually entail versus like what I thought it might entail as I was starting it and be like, oh, actually, I don't want to be doing that with my life for the next three years and, and sort of st- stop these different things, trying to sort of iterate through like, is there something I will actually really enjoy doing as a business that kind of stuff? And yeah, it was hard. I moved from London to Nairobi to start kind of like trying to be an entrepreneur journey, right? Well, why did you choose to do that just out of interest? Did you kind of just already see the problem in Kenya before? Or was it just like a random, I know I'll go to Nairobi and then I'll think of ideas. Because I, I know three people that did that in Myanmar, which is makes no sense. But yeah, they were having like... I spent about six months before leaving McKinsey developing the idea and the plan and getting the team ready. And we ended up raising about half a million dollars of grant R&D funding to go and prove the concept from the World Bank and DFID. So doing all of that gradually and putting a plan together that was like, right, cut the cord, left on Friday, signed out for McKinsey. And by Monday, I showed up in uh, Nairobi, literally never having been to Africa, which it sounds insane. But here's the thing. Whenever I built plans for what started, you, I, in, initially we called it Japanga Kusei, which shows why I, I've learned a little bit about branding since that was a bad name. The names have got better over time. But the, the thing when I was building that, like the business plans were like two years long, three years long. I always thought about it in that way, because at that stage in your career, I was 24. I couldn't think in more than three to five year increments. And I never really knew what I would be doing five years in. Whereas now with all plants, I'm genuinely want and expect and can envision working on this in 10 years, having already worked on it in five years. And I can see a journey beyond that. And that it makes a big difference to the, I mean, the day to day, which of course is a roller coaster, even in a day for anyone, right? You get some great things happen and then some really hard things happen and you're just all over the place. If you're only playing the game for now, that can, I find, rock you all over a lot more. Definitely the, the find that in infinite games kind of, are you playing for the love of playing or are you playing to kind of win straight away? It's a nice premise. That's a good way of thinking about it. I don't know why I hadn't thought about that with the actual ways the businesses that I've wanted to actually do, but it's definitely the ones I just love showing up to every day because I do see it like a long-term thing. It wouldn't be bad. Cool. Anyway, so we got to all plants and I guess I also identified that was one of the areas of business models that I've been thinking about was like veganism, just how annoying it was to not just have tasty things. It's like, I would definitely be vegan if it was easy. If like all restaurants just serve nice vegan food, I would always take it, but they don't. (laughs) Why not? And it's just so frustrating. So yeah, that's why I invested in you guys and stuff. In the early days, the first concept was either a concept plant-based burger joint obviously plenty of those exist now but this is like late 2015 early 2016 or wanted to do kind of like a leon of really fantastic vegan food so that it was quick easy affordable and delightful so those are some of the ideas and because pender health what i built with pender we already had uh, 15 to 20 bricks and mortar retail environments right you know it's healthcare but primary health and uh, had, had learned a lot about how to build that at speed. I was like, yeah, that's easy. Well, that's what we're going to do to really galvanize and ignite a change in people's appetites. 
my gosh, it's different in London. I'm glad it is because as soon as I started looking at properties in Shoreditch and Clerkenwell, and I was like, this is going to require enormous amounts of capital to even open one site. And then we, we wouldn't have sold a thing. Immediately started thinking, hang on a sec, that direct to customer model that I've been looking at for other crazy harebrained ideas and that I've seen, you know, Glossier and Warby Parker, Donna Shave Club turn into massive platforms and movements, that could work. So I started getting pretty excited pretty quickly about how we could bring that together and, and make it easy to eat more plants without having to compromise and be this supposed monk who can abstain from pleasure and convenience. Most of us aren't that. That's why veganism 1.0 had been stuck at 1% of the population because that's to the amazing people who actually are able, they've got the fortitude to have a perspective on the world and actually live in line with it. Most of us hold this weird tension all the time where we've got a perspective on the world, but it's a little bit too hard to live to that because I like sausages or I love cheese. And, I, and to be honest, I was veggie for quite a while before being brave enough to even think about eating vegan. And the whole time I was like, vegans are weird. That's extreme. Why would I give up cheese? I love cheese. That's madness. Like, there's so many paradigms we need to fix and it's all about innovation. And that's what's really exciting because all of those flavors, all of those experiences, all of that cultural pleasure that we get from sitting down and enjoying a meal with our family and friends, you can have it and more with plants because you can have it. And then it's also better for you and better for the planet. What's not to like? So it's, it's just all about using food as our, we do, at least as a vehicle to land that message. And I guess w one of the things I realized was that it doesn't matter with the most people, how many documentaries you show and how convincing or uh, prestigious the doctors or athletes, whether it's Djokovic or Serena Williams or Lewis Hamilton are, who are saying, this is really great for me and my body and for the planet. It doesn't matter because unless you make it way easier and way more delicious, forget it. That's how we decide about food. Motivation to do the thing and the ease of doing it. And so like you can put as much motivation as you want, but it's never going to work if it's not easy kind of thing or, or the other way around. You sort of need both. I call it the will and the way. What I realized was that there was this massive tidal wave of will building up. Loads of people who are primed and who all call themselves environmentalists and who would own an electric vehicle tomorrow if there were more charging stations, if they could afford it. If, you know, but, but none of us can and it's a hassle. And who would eat differently if only there was a way. And you need that way to meet the will, which is basically demand and supply, right? And there isn't enough supply of incredible, delicious, affordable, easy, plant-based food. And, you know, that's what we see as, as our role. I really like that. That's cool. Okay, so you've worked out that's what you wanted to fix. And then how did you then get a kitchen, get customers? Was it sort of you just did it in your own kitchen and just did it to like family and friends for like a few months, like funding? Like... So the early days were a lot of fun. They were pretty loose and rapid. First six months, genuinely, I was full-time in the kitchen two or three days a week. We were running supper clubs every Tuesday night at a cafe around the corner. We moved out of my home kitchen because I was living in a very small one-bed flat and driving my wife mad. So we were renting from this amazing charity who we still support called Made in Hackney. His whole raison d'etre is to help families across Tower Hamlets in Hackney to cook from scratch low-cost plant-based meals. We were cooking two, three days a week and trying to invent the six dishes that we felt were good enough to launch with through the supper clubs is chaotic and all of fun. But meanwhile, we were also trying to work out how can we cook for anyone anywhere in the UK? And how can we do that without having to have kitchens from Edinburgh to Hull to Cornwall, from one amazing kitchen where all our chefs can cook for everyone? And so, you know, solving the challenge of getting freshly cooked food to a doorstep anywhere was a lot of fun. And that was a lot of research and testing and getting all sorts of insulation materials and coolants and trying to make sure that they were all positive for the planet and not using polystyrene, not using high carbon footprint couriers, et cetera. And, you know, got ourselves to a point where we'd solved that. And we then, from starting cooking in March, we then got the prototype live in late September. We wanted to prove that we could, first of all, anyone would find us and buy us. And of course, our first, you know, 50 sales of friends and family. But the next hundred were people who randomly found us through literally us just posting on our Facebook. And it being reshared, which back in the day used to really drive virality. And immediately around 10% within the first couple of months, rebought the six recipes. And we said, okay, well, that, that's good validation. And, and meanwhile, my brother and I jumped on board and we co-founded together. 
which we literally threw everything we had savings wise into building our first kitchen. So that was our phase one kitchen, literally just sat down with a gridded piece of paper and drew a kitchen on it, showed it to a few friends who work in like street food and restaurants. And I was like, does this look like a kitchen that makes sense? And they gave it, you know, sufficient approval for us to feel confident that it cost us about £25,000 to install everything we needed. And then we started cooking. And by the way, then we were like, oh yeah, once we've installed this, we have now used up all our money and now with the product. So turns out now we need to raise seat funding. So that's what we did just after launching in uh, February 2017. That was impressive. And so how did you just go to normal investors at that point? Or was that all angels? It was mainly angels. Is meant to be exclusively angels at that time we barely had an idea really what we were doing in our first month when we launched in january 2017 which is now quite fun to look back on we cooked shipped and sold 130 orders which at the time felt like we'd peaked mount everest and it was an amazing achievement now we do that in a couple of hours so it it feels quite ridiculous but it felt like a big achievement and before we started doing you know any kind of angel raising one of the things that I felt really strongly about was that I didn't want us to bring on board a single investor ever who didn't align with our, the social purpose of our mission. And so I was trying to work out the right mechanism to do that. And with Penda Health, my, one of my previous ventures, we'd even thought about setting it up as a charity or a social enterprise. We ended up deciding to actually keep it as a business. And the reason for that is that there's a real power to a profit-centric model. If it, you can get it to work, and you can get it to deliver on the social value you're trying to create. It's the most scalable and investable model because it provides a financial return, which is at the moment in the world today, the key thing that allows you to mobilize resource behind an idea. And so with all plants, I already felt strongly that we needed to have, again, a a model that made us vastly investable and scalable. I'd always followed the B Corp idea And we became one of the first hundred B Corps in the UK and one of the first thousand in the world. And that was a big moment because it allowed us to say to new investors, hey, what you're signing up to, the articles of our company are different to normal companies. And this isn't just about maximizing profit and return to shareholders. We carry at the same level, maximizing return for the planet and environment and maximizing return for the community and and for, for people. So that was really important to us. It meant that a bunch of previous mentors and colleagues who I was talking to, you know, some of them like challenged me on that. They say, oh, I don't think it's a good idea. I'm not sure you can build a business like this. It sounds a bit hippie. And it meant that we filtered those people out, which actually was really helpful because it, it ensured we were all really well aligned. So yeah, so that, that was a really important thing for us with our angel round. And we ended up with about 20 people coming on board. And then one of those people is called Antoine. And so Antoine kind of spent a lot of time explaining why Phoenix Capital really believed in B Corp, believed, had a strong thesis about the future being plant-based. And so I was, we were really excited to actually say, okay, instead of Antoine investing personally, Phoenix came on board and have been a great supporter ever since. From the point where we got to you as in raising your seed, since then, what's been the most difficult thing that you've had to deal with? Yeah, probably the most challenging phase for a lot of startups, and it certainly was for us was after the seed, everyone who was on our team then, many of whom are still on team now, absolute warriors because we were still so bootstrapped and basically operating off fumes. And with a very small amount of resource we had, we made an incredible growth uh, and learnings and fantastic food happen over the next 18 months. And it allowed us to do what we needed to do to prove that we've got what it takes to go all the way and to show the potential that our brand and our product and our team and our business had to then attract a new round of financing that would allow us to go on to the next phase. That was all really difficult. But then what followed was having run on fumes for such a long time, we basically had to go through a period of good six to 12 months of completely building the team afresh from scratch. And so that phase of hiring was really tough. And and of course, we were very impatient. I, I wanted to keep growing at full rate and full speed, but Actually, it was a really important phase that we had to pay down, kind of like people talk about building up tech debt. And then you get so much tech debt, you have to pay it down. We had organizational debt. We also had operational debt as well, because at that kitchen I spoke about building, we would extended it, knocked it through walls, extended over corridors and added on, you could call it like favela extensions. We had like 
different units all over the place in Seven Sisters, around 14 of them within about a square 500 meters. It was chaos. But that was how we coped with the growth while having to just, in a modular way, add things. And so the operational debt was really important as well. It took us then from closing the A about 15, 16 months to both find the site, get the site, design what we were going to do, and then build what, as you said earlier, you know, now we've, we're set up with the space as, you know, we're Europe's largest dedicated plant-based kitchen. That's amazing. But the journey to get here was flipping hard. And it's, it certainly doesn't make it easy now, but the, going from that kind of everything being MVP to everyone wearing all the hats, et cetera, and to actually building a proper team and the ability to have proper operations. That was a particularly challenging and taxing phase for sure. Yeah, that sounds kind of fun, but slightly stressful after <laughs> a few months of just like, well, all of these things. Yeah, I guess it must have been really confusing not knowing how much you're going to grow or what you'd be needing in sort of five months time versus two months time. But still, you, you did a good job of it, apparently. Were there any major mistakes you made of like getting a unit that actually you didn't need or was like the wrong thing? Oh, so many mistakes. For example, so we used to pick and pack every single box. So we cooked everything, finished product was ready to go. And then we ran our own packing lines and put the nice handwritten cards in and, and DPD came and off they went. And then you run out of space very quickly with an operation like that. So we, we moved from the corridor where we were doing it, myself, Ellie, Ferdy and team, we, we asked the landlord, please, like, what space do you have? And what they had was this yard of a blown out building where the roof didn't really exist. But they said, no, we can just build a roof underneath. So they, they put in like this MDF roof. We moved in there, put a load of freezers in there and everything we needed and just started packing. And that space was probably our least fit for purpose. It served a need for a period. It also turned into our all plants workout center. It was where we did our yoga sessions. And one of our team, Ramos, who's still on site, the PT, had his chin-ups bar in there. But it was, I mean, it was chaotic. And we'd have power outages. And when the weather was bad, it was crazy cold in there. And yeah, you know, you can imagine. So far, what you described until then was like, actually, it's had a great. I was like, yeah, I get to work out. No, 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 no. It was, it was, it was chaotic. So do there anything, I mean, you, we said we were, you had like three things you wanted to discuss and then kept them a secret. Have we gone through the, these three like ideas yet? Because you've spoken about some cool mindset stuff already. So I don't know if that, that was already the things. Yeah, I guess one of, the, one of the other big things has, and I think by luck, started learning this way before being in the world of trying to build something from scratch when this happens pretty much every day. And I, I, maybe I'll share a few examples of where I experienced it before, but basically it's just the expectation that you're going to hear no a lot in order to get the yes you need, I tend to find is really, really important to get comfortable and familiar with. And basically by other measures, you could say not being willing to take no as an answer. One of the earliest experiences of learning this is I um, so I went to Nottingham University, studied history, loved history. It was awesome. It was fantastic. I wasn't meant to go to Nottingham University. I wasn't actually meant to go to any university because the first year I applied to uni, I got rejected by every university I applied to. I still don't really understand why because I was almost a painfully keno student and had all the flipping A stars and A's and whatever. So the, the grades were there, which is fine. In some instances, people, you know, the challenge is you, the grades aren't there because you've had a tougher education or tougher upbringing. The grades are there, but I got no's across the board. So then I took a year out and that's where I did the cheeky foray into uh, trying out paralegaling, which was a great way to save money up before going backpacking. But I reapplied, even with the A's in hand for the A-levels. I think I got a few places at backup at unis, but the places I really wanted to go, which were Nottingham or Bristol, because everyone I spoke to said they were the most fun and they were really great and whatever. And I figured that the whole point of uni was to make sure you had a really fun time, which I still definitely think is a key factor they both said no offhand like straight away and so it's not normal when you get your UCAS come back saying no to then ask people why but I then just decided it didn't make sense and so I spent about three months bombarding the admissions departments of both those unis with phone calls letters emails etc just being like can you tell me what should I have done can you tell me what I need to do would you reconsider etc and by the way it all fell on deaf ears all fell on deaf ears didn't get any response and then by complete luck, I was visiting a friend at Nottingham one weekend and, you know, 
almost excruciatingly experiencing just how fun this place would have been if I got to go. And, uh, and my friend, obviously, I woke up one morning, definitely hung over because I was being exposed to this uni thing, which is very extreme compared to your normal life. And he said, listen, why don't you just go to the history department and see what happens? Like, you never know. Just go. I'm so glad. This is an old friend, a guy called Nick Altman, which I, I must send another message to tell him how much I appreciate him giving me this nudge because it genuinely changed my way of thinking thereafter. So I, he said, go and see what happens. So I go down. Honestly, I'm so hungover. I don't have a clue what really I'm doing. I show up to the history department. I ask for this guy called Dr. Ross Bowseretti, and uh, I get directed to his door. On his door, even, it said that he only had two hours of available time a week when you can knock on his door. And so it wasn't in those hours, right? And this is what happens at uni. You're not supposed to knock on I knocked on the door. The voice inside says, come in. And so I open the door. I go in. I say, hi, I'm Jonathan Petridis. I've been emailing you and sent you a letter about my admissions. And, and it's honestly, suddenly, having looked normal, he went completely cold and was like, uh, uh, I can't talk to you about that right now. That's not something we can review. You'll have to arrange an appointment. And then I was, I was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to put a face to the name and, you know, come and let you know that I would really love to that. And I left the room and I was like, well, I've completely blown it now. There's absolutely no chance. And I, you know, I thought I'd completely screwed. Got back to work on the Monday and I had an email on Monday afternoon saying, we reviewed your application and we'd like to offer you a flipping place and not the <laughs> And, I was, and, and so, and, you know, which was fantastic. And I was really excited. It was great. And I guess for me, the learning from that was no is never no. There's always a way to convert no to a yes. As ludicrous as it sounds, I deeply believe that. And I think bringing that mind, that, that, and it can be quite an annoying mindset, by the way, to work with me, because that's what I think. And so I really think we should, we can always push that. But it really makes a difference. And by the way, it makes a difference with fundraising, with closing deals, with hiring people, all sorts of things where you're like, you know, I've had, by the way, look, I, I tell you, in the journey, not just with All Plants, but with other ventures as well, the amount of times I've had really important members of staff say, I'm done. This is it. I can't do it anymore. I, I'm exhausted. Or any, and I said, really? Like, do, are we sure? Like, what can we do? And like, work with them through it, as opposed to saying, Okay. And just assuming that there's no way to work on a problem. And, and if I hadn't got lucky with that, who knows if I would have believed in it so much. But as a result, I really do. That's so cool. I definitely think that life experiences really make a big difference to you. I certainly had like some similar things around that time, going through like gap year, uni stuff. Also, yeah, I applied to Nottingham and Bristol, but I got into both of them straight away. And <laughs> so I went to Bristol because it was slightly higher. But in hindsight, my friends in Nottingham seem to have a lot more fun. So I have a bit of envy in some ways. And also, what's interesting is if you had been accepted straight away, maybe you wouldn't have learned such a valuable life lesson. But at the time, you're like, shit, this is, all, this is terrible. But actually, it was like the best thing that maybe happened to you in terms of teaching you so much, which is kind of interesting. So maybe you were lucky to get rejected, whereas I was the unlucky one having <laughs> <laughs> been bigger. <laughs> I see what you've done there. I see what you've done there. Very Woe good is me, JP. Damn it. <laughs> Some of us have a hard life, you know? And, and by the way, I feel incredibly lucky in all the ways. When I look at the fact that I even get to work on this problem every day is all built on the fact that I've had so many opportunities through my life. And I think in the majority of people who've had the, this incredible privileged education and early career opportunities and family that you can count on, and that's amazing. So why shouldn't more people with all of that in hand be seeing what they can do and taking as much risk as they can find to try and actually give something back and do something valuable in the world. And by the way, it gives back to you as well, because it's, it's an amazing privilege. Obviously, it feels great. And it's, it really bonds a team as well and a culture to be able to work on something that feels bigger than you and worth doing. Yeah, the more interesting the mission is, like, it's so much easier to stay enthusiastic and to have people kind of align behind it. So it's definitely something I'm trying to work on, like explaining missions better and picking the big challenges, because that's kind of the point of life, I guess. Okay, so a few final questions, if it's okay. What would you say is your life's mantra? I'm relatively obsessed with the mission that we are building all plants for. And I guess that probably dictates how I spend a lot of my time. So our constant effort to inspire the world to eat more plants is like a high level obsession. And then perhaps undercurrent within that, I think it's quite hard to summarize your own outlook on life into mantras off the bat. 
But yeah, I guess just trying to always not take yourself too seriously and actually enjoy every day and every moment because with the mundanity and repetitiveness of things, you really have to actually actively think to recognize at the end of every day, oh yeah, that was actually a good thing that happened. And the, or, or, oh yeah, that was fun when I went out for a little jog earlier and saw my friend who was walking their dog. You know, just the smallest of things is quite important. What would you say is your earliest memory or one of your really early memories? As little kids, we used to get to spend the majority of summer in Cyprus with my family, which is where my family all are and live. And, you know, I'm half Cypriot. So just getting to run around with my cousins and not really understand what everyone was saying because everyone was speaking Greek and our Greek was really sketchy when I was a kid. But it was really sunny and it is lovely there. It is. I used to go there a lot as a kid as well. Too many similarities. I don't like this. <laughs> I, uh, I actually, one of my um, things was that we're starting a vegan business. Like I said, I actually put a bunch of plans into like a concept I called Veganators. I'm going to go down more like my protein for vegans initially and then sort of branch out into more like a healthy version of McDonald's that was vegan based or something like fast food. But then I got preoccupied with other stuff. What is one of the kindest things someone has done for you? Without a doubt, the kindest person I've ever met and in my life is Delphi, my wife. I've got lists longer than any arm, leg or Excel spreadsheet I could fill with ways in which Delphi is kind, not just to me, but to everyone around us. And it, I feel like she teaches me every day the real meaning of uh, being kind. So, so yeah, Delphi is my shining light when it comes to learning about how to be kind and experiencing kindness. That's love. Very happy for you having such a kind wife. Flash, mildly jealous. Same as my uh, <laughs> issue with not having um, Bristol and Nottingham reject me. Probably worse, but, you know, I'll get through these things. So those were my... Sorry to be cheesy, but if you're going to ask me about kindness, that's, I mean, no. is just an absolute G about that, for sure. That's and cool. many other things. Well, cool. Is there anything else you want to ask me or you quickly want to say? before I let you get back to uh, running your crazily hectic business and, <sighs> or going to talk to your wife, perhaps? <laughs> no, look, Sam, it's been, it's been really great. And I think the project, this project is really cool, kind of trying to chronicle and learn about growth mindset. I think it's such an important part of all of us helping ourselves to find new heights and do things we didn't even think we were capable of doing. So really fun to be a part of. And thanks for inviting me on. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for coming and making the time. Cheers. Awesome. Thanks so much for JP coming on the show. He is doing some great things and has some brilliant lessons and stories to match it. I think he's so right about the fact that you can convert a no to a yes if you really try. And often so many people fail because they simply don't show up. I scored an epic job sailing around the Caribbean as an 18-year-old by simply going to the Caribbean and asking for jobs. If I'd waited at home trying to get a job by applying online, it would never have happened. But if you just show up, you're doing more than 99% of people out there. So if there is something you've been dreaming of, don't be afraid to show up and put some faces to names and try converting some no's to a yes. Think big and then act even bigger. And then on that... If you enjoy the show, you're welcome to tell everyone that this show is incredible and great, and that way I can continue making shows and avoid getting a real job. As JP says, you can convert a no to a yes. So if you're always like, no, Mr. Podcaster, I'm not bothering to open my phone and rate your podcast. Well, today might be that day that you dare to say yes. Or not. Who cares? I'll move on. Remember that life is to be enjoyed, so don't put that off until tomorrow. Enjoyment is not to be squirreled away for some future situation, which you might never even reach. Get on the train today and be kind to yourself. And whilst you're at it, be kind to someone else too.